Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. It getting darker earlier as the clouds move in, carrying with them some much needed rain to parts of our viewing area. Who's getting that rain and who still could as we head into the night? Sarah Spivey will have the latest coming up in just a few minutes. Area hospitals now caring for more than 1,500 patients with COVID-19. As the city of San Antonio reports the highest number of COVID patients in our hospitals since this pandemic began, we continue hearing from families who've been impacted. A woman from Plainview that's located near Lubbock has been battling COVID-19 for weeks at a hospital right here in San Antonio. Her family spoke with our Tiffany Huertas and has a strong message to the community. She's been through so much and there are so many people that are here for her that miss her. Plainview resident Michaela Hinojosa, also known as Mickey, has been battling COVID-19 since November. Her daughter was over it within a couple of days and she thought maybe she was going to be the same way. Andy Hinojosa says his sister was taken to an emergency room on November 24th. They did blood tests, so... And I think at one o'clock in the morning, she texted me saying that she had COVID pneumonia. The family says they told Mickey they needed to send her to a hospital where they can treat her. They transferred her to San Antonio. She's been at Krista Santa Rosa Hospital in the medical center. She went to the ICU for 21 days, 20, between 21 and 23 days. Then she got a tracheotomy. And then a couple, about less than a week, she was transferred over to just the COVID wing. She's still dealing with several symptoms, including fatigue and a cough. She talks to the kids, but I mean, it's short periods of time. The family hopes their story will help someone. I think everybody should take it seriously. We took it seriously, but, you know, it took it to a whole new level when I had all my family members go to ICU. Krista's Health says with the spike in COVID cases, they have seen an increase in calls from out of the region. Many communities are at capacity and unable to manage the volume or complexity of patients at their facilities. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. A local doctor is clearing up some confusion around whether the FDA is allowing people who receive a COVID-19 vaccine to donate plasma with antibodies to help heal sick patients. That doctor with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says a person having antibodies developed from a vaccine alone is not eligible to donate plasma to help patients who are already sick with COVID-19. However, someone who was vaccinated could still be eligible to donate plasma if they had COVID-19 and still have the antibodies from the infection. When it's part of your natural immunity, the immune response is a really broad type of immune response. In addition to plasma, the ongoing pandemic has also led to a major call for blood donations from people who are currently healthy, regardless of a former COVID-19 diagnosis. There's a blood drive competition happening right now until the 22nd in each San Antonio City Council District. Visit KSAT.com for all the details. And as the vaccine continues to trickle into Texas, the state's commissioner of health warning Texans not to forget about COVID-19 precautions. During a visit in Houston at Houston Methodist today with the governor, Dr. John Hellerstedt praised the hospital's work in delivering the vaccine in mass. The hospital, one of more than 70 vaccine hub providers listed by the state, However, Hellerstadt said going on the offensive against the pandemic with a vaccine, it still doesn't mean Texans can forget about defending themselves from getting sick. And that's why everyone in this room who's not speaking is wearing a mask. We need to continue to engage in those infection prevention and control behaviors until we have really uh, finally uh, driven COVID-19 into something in history and we can get on with the way of life that we prefer. According to state data, more than 1.3 million doses have been administered statewide. 177,000 people are fully vaccinated today. San Antonio police say criminal charges are coming in connection with a deadly motorcycle accident on the city's south side late last night. This happened along Loop 410 between I-37 and South WW White Road a little before midnight. According to police, two motorcyclists were racing when their bikes collided, causing both riders to lose control. One slid off the highway and hit a light pole. That man died there at the scene. While all this was happening, a semi truck was trying to avoid the crash and rolled his big rig. No serious injuries reported for that driver. The rider of the other motorcycle was taken to Bamsey with a broken leg and dislocated wrist. 
We're told he will be charged with racing, causing death. We've learned the name of the man killed in a crash with a VIA bus on Sunday night. The Bear County Medical Examiner said 31 year old Gary Mondo Benavidez killed in the wreck at the intersection of Commercial Avenue and Grosvenor Street. That's on the city's south side. According to police, Benavidez's car was T boned by the bus after he ran a stop sign. He was ejected after the bus knocked the car into a nearby parking lot. Then his car rolled on top of him. He was pronounced dead at the scene. New at six earlier attempts failed, but Joe Biden says overhauling the nation's immigration laws will be priority one after he's sworn in as president tomorrow. He's proposing more technology on the border and the long awaited path to citizenship for so-called dreamers. Those brought here illegally as children. Jesse Degollado now with initial reaction to what some of what it could mean and its chances of passing in Congress. From DACA recipients like this young woman who applied when she was in high school to migrants who had arrived in the U.S. prior to January 1st and before any restrictions were imposed by the Trump administration are all included in President-elect Joe Biden's wide-ranging immigration proposal. What's your initial impression so far? I think it is a very good first step. Even Biden's eight-year path to citizenship, she says, sounds reasonable. But Sarah Ramey says it'll take a lot of negotiating by Congress, although there could still be bipartisan support. But, she says. The devil's really in the details, as we say. And my hope is simply that that debate um, does not put us in a place where we're just stuck in the mud again. Neither does the DACA recipient pictured here with her future husband. We need 10 Republicans, and in some cases we might even actually need 12 Republicans, depending on how the Dems and the voting. Fernandez should know working for the Texas Immigration Coalition supporting Biden's proposal. Instead of two year protections for DACA recipients, she says legislation would lead to permanent legal status, even citizenship. It creates stability for a lot of us, especially because the last four years was a travesty. <laughs> she realizes it'll take time, but Fernandez says if it doesn't happen now, she believes it'll still happen. We just need to keep pushing because right now we are in a really good spot for us to ensure that our communities are protected. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. You do it six with horses as the centerpiece. There is a unique form of therapy available for children in the juvenile justice program in Bear County. The program is called CHAPS. Children and horses always produce success. Paul Venema takes us to a Southside Juvenile Correctional Facility for a first-hand look, a look that doesn't include children's faces since they're juveniles. And is that going to work for everyone, you think, or do you think that different things work for different animals? This CHAPS program, one of just a few in the state, has been in operation here for almost a decade. It's available to children who reside at the Cryer Juvenile Correctional Facility. Chief Juvenile Probation Officer Jill Mata oversees the operation. It is such a unique and wonderful way to bring about change in these children's lives. The children get to feed, groom, and perhaps one day ride the horses. There's a special bond between animals and kids, and their animals are such a wonderful therapeutic um, uh, outlet or, or way to bring about change. Do you do something someone asks you to if you don't trust them? No. Therapists determine which children participate in the program. They have to sort of earn their way into the program and be a good candidate for the program. But once they're in the program and committed to it, the children really uh, experience change quickly and you really see the results in other aspects of their life. Which is the program's objective? Program coordinator Jocelyn Rice. This program was developed to try and give children an opportunity to explore something that they probably never have before. Juvenile court judge Lisa Jarrett sees the results in court. As they work, they start to learn each other and they start to depend on each other, respect each other, and trust each other. And that, says Mata, translates into major behavior and lifestyle changes. As children that go through this program go back out into the community and they have stronger, more healthy relationships. They know themselves better. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to I-10 West at Loop 1604. And yes, Beneficial rain out there as that part of San Antonio getting hit right now and it's kind of been pockety 
throughout the area. Yeah, and a big temperature drop-off, Sarah. Big temperature drop-off because of a cold front move through. Steve calls it pockety. I call it hit or miss. Okay. That's kind of been the way it is. But I like that pockety. I'm going to use that more in our <laughs> forecast. All right, we are getting some rain in the area, but as Myra hinted at earlier, temps are dropping pretty quickly behind a front. 54 degrees at the airport. We were just in the 70s a couple of hours ago. Temperatures in the 40s in the hill country. Winds are gusting up to 25 to 30 miles per hour behind that front. Here's a look at radar. Let's go ahead and take a quick neighborhood view. Generally, areas north of Highway 90 are getting these quick showers that are moving through. Out near Medina Lake, getting a quick drink of water there. And we did have one area that got a good, good dose of rainfall, kind of uh, close to the Alamo Parkway area on the northwest side of town. But as you can see, these are gradually moving to the north. We'll carry a chance for 60% uh, scattered rain at about 8. But we'll, rain, we'll see rain taper off by about midnight when we'll start to get into the 40s. But areas west of San Antonio have a good chance to see more rainfall tomorrow morning and even here in San Antonio. We'll see another chance for rain tomorrow, too. So I've got a lot to unpack. I'll have a look ahead coming up in a few minutes. A record number of hospitalizations yesterday when it comes to COVID-19. Let's go to City Hall now to see what the latest numbers hold for today. We're joined tonight by Dr. Junda Wu, who is our Bear County Public Health, Health Authority. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 2,395 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 152,231. And our new seven-day rolling average remains above 2,000. It stands at 2,041. Unfortunately, we have 10 new deaths to report tonight. They are males and females, Hispanic and white, the youngest being in their 30s and 40s, and the oldest in their 70s. Folks, this virus does not discriminate. By now, we've all heard of someone who is of relatively good health and probably young uh, and succumbing to COVID-19. So please keep that in mind. We must remain vigilant. We must do everything we can to protect our loved ones, our family and friends and neighbors from this disease. And please keep those who we've lost and their survivors in your prayers this evening. Tonight, there are 1,507 people fighting COVID-19 in area hospitals. That's down 13 from yesterday. We have 164 new admissions in the last 24 hours. 435 are in intensive care and 257 are on ventilators. Uh, slight decreases in the census at our hospital as well as those in ICU and on ventilators. So that's uh, some, some slight good news for today. The school indicator bar remains in the high risk level, which means that in-person learning uh, is not recommended at this time. And before I turn it over to Judge Wolf, I do want to finally give an update on vaccines. Metro Health did receive its shipment of doses uh, from Pfizer today, so the appointments that were rescheduled for tomorrow will uh, happen. With vaccines in hand, we've also reopened the registration system for Thursday appointments. As a reminder, we will offer appointments on a rolling basis uh, to spread out demand for the vaccine and also to ensure that these uh, very unsteady shipments that have been received uh, by cities all across the country doesn't create problems downstream for folks. As new appointments become available, we will periodically open, uh, to s open the system to fill them. And you can register on the website covid19.sanantonio.com gov slash vaccine. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And it was good to see a little bit of a downtick in the hospital, but don't expect that to last when you still got another 2,400 or so today that have uh, been infected in the large numbers, over 1,000 every day. You can expect some increased hospitalization as we go along. You know, we, we report to you how many people have passed away from uh, COVID. Uh, uh, since this started, uh, I think 1,800 and some odd now, but what we don't normally uh, report to you, and I was looking over some reports today that we've had 5,580 different individuals in the hospital uh, going through December. So that's a significant number of people that have been really hurt by COVID, may have some lasting health, uh, health problems. And so it's not only the um, people that pass away, but the people that have... Uh, uh, really got a serious case of uh, COVID and, and uh, spent time in the hospital and, uh, like I say, may have some long-term implications uh, from that. Uh, we did about another uh, 1,550 vaccinations today. That's school personnel, 
uh, that uh, were on the front line as well as uh, patients that had some health issues. Uh, we do have about 7,800 doses that we'll be able to do out at the um, uh, Wonderland Mall. That's the university health system. So uh, we'll continue to do about 1,500 a day out there. And uh, I know tomorrow we're supposed to hear for sure how many more doses we'll have through a university health system. So we're continuing to move forward. Um, we know there's going to be a big change in Washington tomorrow with the inauguration of uh, President Biden. He's laid out some things that he intends to do differently. And one of them, and we'll see if this happens, is uh, a greater federal pressure on the manufacturers to get out more doses of vaccine, which is a critical aspect that we're all facing uh, right now, facing across the country as this uh, uh, COVID has spread across the country and causing devastation just about everywhere you look. So hopefully uh, things will change. Great. Thank you very much, Judge. And um, we also did receive our EPI report today. And something to keep in mind as you think about the risk uh, when you leave your home and the reason why you should wear your mask and practice the protocols that our health professionals have been saying from the very beginning. This pandemic now is uh, nearly 11 months long. But in the month of December, we had 30 percent of all the cases that we've had during this pandemic present in the month of December. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Please continue to protect yourself and your family from this virus. Also, if uh, struggling the mayor there wrapping up the daily briefing uh, with the latest numbers. 2,395 new cases of COVID confirmed in our community. 10 new deaths to report this evening. Some of those victims in their 30s and 40s. So a reminder from the mayor that we all have heard stories now of people who are young, who have no known underlying health conditions, who have been gravely affected uh, by this illness. That seven day rolling average, still over 2,000, 2,041 cases on average per 24 hours. Yeah, this virus does not discriminate the words of the mayor. Uh, the hospitalizations were down, but only by about 13 people. The school indicator bar again at high risk. And I noticed that uh, Senator Jose Menendez had asked the TEA to loosen up the restrictions to let schools close down if they want to. And of course, to move uh, our educators to the front of the line when it comes to vaccines. So that's the very latest developments from City Hall and uh, a little bit of what we're hearing from the state capitol. All right, let's turn now to the forecast out there. We've got some rain in our area, which is much needed. We've been waiting for a while, Sarah. We have. Now, most people who are getting the rain live north of Highway 90 at the moment. And look, you're going to travel with me to the green screen, I guess, today. It's 54 degrees at the airport, but it's 70 degrees in Pleasanton. So a 16 degree difference from San Antonio to Pleasanton. That front is currently working its way into Atascosa County. Look at this rainfall. Really in Medina County right now, we're getting the most of the rain just to the north of Highway 90, north of Hondo Medina Lake, seeing some good rainfall. The northeast side of Bear County near Holotus, right in downtown San Antonio, quick splash and dash shower. Some of these are quite potent to near the Stone Oak area. Uh, one of these showers is capable of producing a quick uh, about a quarter to half inch of rainfall. These are moving to the north and starting to die down, as you can see, but near Seguin, quick little dose of rain as well. Now, throughout the rest of the evening, we're going to see the rain kind of let up. As you can see in the high res future cast is that uh, front moves to the south, but to our west for areas near Del Rio or Friends at Eagle Pass, Uvalde, Lakey, Rock Springs, you have a very good chance to see some healthy rainfall in the overnight and early Wednesday morning hours. Here in San Antonio, we'll still see some hit or miss showers tomorrow morning, but as you can see, rain will let up uh, after about lunch. Uh, rain should be more isolated. So let's take you through your forecast tomorrow. Tomorrow in San Antonio, 46 seven in the morning with 60% chance for scattered showers. Our temperatures are only going to rise into the low to mid fifties in the afternoon because of the cloud cover and we will potentially have an isolated shower in the afternoon, but really the main rainfall tomorrow will be in the morning and again, it'll be hit or miss. There will be those that get the rain and the, those that don't, but look at this. We do have a chance for isolated rain in the forecast through the weekend and even into early next week. Other than the cool day tomorrow, this upcoming forecast is pretty gonna be, pretty much going to be very spring like with mild temperatures, mugginess in the air and a shot at isolated rain. And that's the good news. Yeah, isolated rain chances there. Thanks, Sarah.
Uh, you know they say sharing is caring? Yeah. <laughs> the Spurs have been very good at sharing the basketball game. Yeah, and, and just coming off their, their best game, I think, of the season so far against Portland, they had 33 assists in that game. Wow. That is sharing, and that is caring. When we come back, second most in team history. We'll talk about that. And also, will Patrick Mahomes play in the conference championship game? Coming up. A short two-game West Coast road trip. The Spurs accomplished a number of milestones. For the first time in franchise history, the Spurs had four players who are 30 or over score at least 20 points, led by LaMarcus Aldridge with 22, DeMar DeRozan with 20 points with 11 assists. In fact, he wasn't the only one. DeJounte Murray also had 11 assists, and the Spurs as a team finished with 33, the second most in Spurs history. And get this, the Spurs bench outscored the Blazers reserves 59-25, led by a combined 42 points from Patty Mills and Rudy Gay in the 125-104 victory. But what does it mean that for the first First time since 1996, the Spurs had two players at 10 or more assists in a game. Just, you know, translate uh, into helping you win basketball games. So they're unselfish guys and they don't really care who scores. It's just a matter of playing the game the right way. The way we play, we need people to go down to create shots for us. We, you know, to get open shots, that's just how they would have to do night in, night out. Lamar is taking it personal. Uh, uh, um, Jockey's taking the personal and they've begun, you know, to progress in that area. We all know they can get to the basket. Start making plays for everybody else. Makes the game easier. All right, working on that audio for sure tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Tip time tomorrow against Golden State. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The biggest question going into conference championship weekend to decide who gets to go to Super Bowl 55 is will Patrick Mahomes be able to play? The reigning Super Bowl MVP was knocked out of their divisional playoff game against the Cleveland Browns midway through the third quarter when he got up woozy after taking a hit on this run. He was immediately placed in concussion protocol and now that decision to play or not to play against the Buffalo Bills this Sunday is completely out of the hands of the Chiefs. He will have to be cleared by an independent medical advisor agreed upon by both the league and the Players Association in order to suit up on Sunday. Chiefs head coach Andy Reid is very aware of the situation he is in. Because of the protocol, we are, it's a no-brainer from the coach's standpoint. You don't have to think about it. You just have to go forward and make sure you have an answer if he's there and an answer if he's not there. Uh, I can't tell you from a medical standpoint where he's at. I mean, I don't know that. So uh, that's their decision and I just follow it. We'll know more tomorrow if he's able to practice for the big game at 540 Sunday at Arrowhead Stadium. Like last week, we're witnessing another first in the NFL playoffs. First time six-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady has gone up against Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers in the postseason. Last week, it was the first meeting between Brady and Breeze, the two oldest quarterbacks in the league. Now this week is another first since Brady jumped from the AFC to the NFC this season with the Bucs. But this is not the first time these two quarterbacks have met on the field. It was as recent as week six when the Bucs beat the Packers 38-10, to and Brady leaves the all-time series against Rodgers two games to one but the Packers have one big advantage this Sunday playing in projected 29 degree weather even though Brady has seen his fair share of snow but a lot of his teammates have not yeah it's chilly man it's that's that's a uh, January football in Northeast Midwest and um, we'll be prepared you know the team that plays the best gonna win not the team that is the coldest or you know we're gonna have to go out there and play well and um, we're gonna be challenged and it's gonna be a great game Good news is to be at 2 o'clock to kick off for the NFC Championship. So keeping the temperatures a little above, or in this case, a little below freezing for that game. And coming up tonight at 10 o'clock on the night beat, a first in Super Bowl history. You'll like this. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. Before the pomp and circumstance that traditionally surrounds an inauguration, President-elect Joe Biden is taking some time to reflect on his life, his family, and the lives lost to the COVID-19 pandemic. Whitney Wilde in Washington to explain. Hallelujah. A solemn moment on the eve of Joe Biden's inauguration. The president-elect, along with Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, stopping by the Lincoln Memorial to pay tribute to the more than 400,000 American lives lost to COVID-19. To heal, we must remember. Between the COVID-19 pandemic and security concerns, this inauguration will look different than any other. Nearly 200,000 flags now fly on the National Mall, one for every person unable to attend the celebration. It's kind of emotional for me. 
The president-elect started the day in Delaware and honored his late son, Bo. I only have one regret. He's not here because he should, we should be introducing him as president. Biden then departed for Washington, where he will be sworn in as president. This week, we inaugurate a new administration and pray for its success in keeping America safe and prosperous. During Donald Trump's final hours in the White House, he touted his administration's accomplishments. We built the greatest economy in the history of the world. On his final full day in office, President Trump is expected to issue around 100 pardons and commutations. And despite not attending Biden's inauguration, America's Trump wish his successor process. well. We extend our best wishes, and we also want them to have luck, a very important word. In Washington, I'm Whitney Wild. It's some big trouble for a 25 year old man from South Texas as the South Texas Border Patrol agents say he tried to smuggle more than half a million dollars worth of heroin into the United States from Mexico over the weekend. Officers seized the shipment of drugs at the Juarez Lincoln Bridge on Saturday. They say the man who is a United States citizen had 33 packages hidden in an SUV, almost 30 pounds of heroin with a street value of more than $650,000. Border Patrol agents seized the drugs, arrested that driver, the case in the hands of ICE and Homeland Security investigations. Here at home, San Antonio police investigating a late night crash that sent two people to a hospital and led to criminal charges for the driver police say caused that crash. This happened just before 10 last night at the intersection of Bartmer Avenue and Ben Russ Boulevard on the city's west side. Police say a truck was traveling south on Ben Russ Boulevard when it hit a car, sending it into a parked car. Witnesses told police the truck was speeding before the crash. The driver and passenger of the second vehicle taken to a nearby hospital. The driver in critical condition. The passenger with non-life threatening injuries. The truck driver, Carlos Rivera Landin, charged with intoxication assault. All right, Myra pointed it out earlier. Not only are we getting some great rain, the temperatures are yeah, dropping it's off as well. chilly out there. They are for most of the day today. You know, it felt very spring like temperatures were in the 70s, but we are currently at 54 degrees. We're starting to see the rain let up out there, but we will continue to have rain chances in San Antonio, especially through tomorrow morning. Here's a look at the time lapse. I love a time lapse on a rainy day, especially today when the rain is uh, kind of hit or miss. You can see every now and then the uh, tower cam there gets a dose of rainfall officially at the airport. We've only seen three hundredths of an inch of rainfall, but the areas that have seen rain have seen a quick quarter to half an inch of rainfall uh, in the area. So that's some pretty good news there. Just officially only a three hundredths of an inch of rainfall. The high today was 72. The low actually happening right now. Again, 54 degrees. Here's a look at the radar. I want us to focus in on one area from Uvalde to La Prior, even up to Lakey and Brackettville. South of Uvalde, this area is called the Winter Garden Region because they they, uh, through irrigation, harvest a lot of vegetables and specifically even onions. The winter garden region needs the rain. It's under extreme drought, and so it's nice to see the rainfall there. Generally, around San Antonio, the rain is occurring north of Highway 90. Let's go ahead and head out to the west near Hondo along Highway 90, and you can see a couple of showers moving from south to north across Medina Lake and into Bandera County. Around downtown San Antonio and just north of downtown, a couple of splash and dash showers just to the south of of Leon Valley. Uh, let's go ahead and head up to the north here near Bolverde. We were seeing a couple of showers earlier, but those have since pushed on off into the north uh, part of uh, the county there. And then out toward Gonzales, a couple of quick showers near Seguin as well. As I said, the rainfall activity is starting to taper down a little bit, but we'll continue to see rain chances tomorrow morning. I'll show you that future cast in a bit, but here's a pretty uh, really impressive image here. There's that cold front just to the south of Stinson. Stinson at 58. Pleasanton at 70. The front is yet to move through Pleasanton, but it is on the way to Atascosa County. Meanwhile, it's 46 at Bernie Stage, 46 in Kerrville, and 48 in Comfort. A wider view here, 44 in Fredericksburg, 52 in Austin. Still warm down in Corpus Christi, where it's 70 degrees. Let's take you through the high-risk future cast again. You'll notice that the rain will taper off in the evening hours, but by the overnight hours into early morning, we're going to see a lot of development 
development out to our west. Again, that winter garden region going to be getting a good dose of rain. Eagle Pass, Del Rio, Rock Springs, Lake e, Kerrville, all of a better chance for more widespread rain than us here in San Antonio, but we'll still carry a 60% chance for scattered hit or miss showers in the morning hours tomorrow around San Antonio. The rain will let up into the afternoon with only a few isolated showers remaining in the area. And again, this is the main area that's going to get the good healthy rain up to an inch of rainfall in those areas in the blue. Unfortunately, here in San Antonio, we'll probably get a little bit less than a half an inch of rain in spots, but still the chances there in the morning. And again, look at this extreme drought in this area that desperately needs the rainfall from Uvalde to La Prior to Carrizo Springs, even up to Bandera. So we hope that that uh, inch of rainfall uh, in some some spots out there is beneficial for them as well as areas near Del Rio uh, and Eagle Pass, which are under severe drought. Here's the 411 in San Antonio. All right, we're going to wake up tomorrow morning 47 degrees with scattered hit or miss showers in the morning hours. Rainfall will taper off into the afternoon. 54 only for the high. It's going to be a chilly day and we'll have winds from the northeast breezy 10 to 15 gusting up to 20 miles per hour. In addition to the front that's moving through, we've also got a big upper level low pressure system over Baja, California. This is going to make our weather pattern a little messy as we head into the weekend. And in fact, what we'll see is a chance for isolated rain through Friday, Saturday and Sunday as well. A very spring like forecast for us as temperatures rebound back into the 70s. Keep up to date with us through the KSAT weather app. All right, thanks, Sarah. We'll be right back with Mayor Ron Nuremberg. It is our KSAT Q&A where we separate fact from fiction out there and dive deeper into some of the uh, subjects that we've been talking about and certainly Coronavirus, COVID-19 vaccines, a big part of what we've been talking about uh, for, what, 11 months now, I think I heard the mayor say uh, in his uh, briefing today. The mayor joins us now, Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Thank you, as always, for your time. Right off the top, I want to talk about schools. You put this, the school risk indicator bar out today. It's high risk. There, yeah. there are some moves at the state level. I saw that uh, Senator Jose Menendez was asking the TEA for more flexibility when it comes to whether schools could close down or restrict people who come there, as well as getting educators to the front of the line. Are you yeah. in support of that? Did you, I mean, are you basically saying this is a good idea as well? Absolutely in support of what Senator Menendez has called for. Um, as you know, the judge and I have been calling for uh, teachers to be uh, moved up and school staff that have direct contact with kids to be moved up uh, the line vaccine to protect themselves, but also the school communities. But we also want to make sure that schools don't feel the pressure of losing funding in terms of making decisions about healthful ways of returning to class. That shouldn't be the way we're making decisions in the state of Texas or in public schools for that matter. So we want to make sure that schools are able to follow the health guidance and not feeling undue pressure uh, because of uh, funding from the TEA. Vaccines clearly are, are top of mind for everybody right now, and the demand is so high here locally. We're seeing how fast those thousands of appointments are filling up. You mentioned earlier yeah. that that delayed shipment from Pfizer has now been received. So can you tell people what's the status of getting an appointment in the future or the next round of appointments being open for registration? Well, again, uh, we have a, a, a veritable flooding of uh, demand because the state has now opened up eligibility to 1A and 1B, which comprises over 60% of our population, over a million people. Uh, and, and they have not matched that. The federal government has not matched that with the level of supply that we're getting in. We're, we're getting anywhere between 20 and 30,000 doses per week in our community. That's clearly not enough to keep up with demand. So I was on a, a Zoom call with about 50 mayors from all over the country our story is not much different than what they're experiencing everywhere else. In every single one of these cities, uh, there's 50 different ways that they're being handled. So what we've established is four different mass vaccination sites, two of which are being done uh, strictly through phone uh, appointment scheduling to make sure that people who don't have internet access have, have equal access to these uh, vaccine doses. But we also are doing online registrations. And you can imagine how quickly those fill up with you know, this pandemic raging and, and people wanting to get their vaccines. So uh, we're we are working through this process the best we can. But it is it is very frustrating uh, for everyone involved and will remain that way, unfortunately, until 
at the federal level and through the manufacturers, we start getting more supply into our communities. I want to take a quick break and I want to continue uh, the conversation on this specific topic when we come back. I want to know specifically what is a setup that would be smoother and work better. We'll talk about that after the break. Back with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and we're talking about vaccines because obviously there's a huge demand out there for people that want the vaccines. And, and uh, there's some frustration across the country with how this, these are being distributed, how few doses are actually getting into people's arms. What do you think is the solution? And are you optimistic that the federal government will maybe change its role one way or the other when Joe Biden is sworn in at noon tomorrow? Uh, I'm hopeful uh, that something will be done because we've been making, uh, sending some messages very loudly uh, to the federal government uh, before and after this uh, transition. Uh, a couple things could be done immediately. Number one is we could get a, a steadier uh, predictability in the supplies that we're getting in our local communities. Right now, we're only getting uh, days at notice about how much we're going to get in terms of supply. So what that's doing is it's preventing us from opening up additional appointments so that we can schedule, say, less, uh, not a week in advance, but two or three or even a month in advance so people at least know that they're going to have a vaccine. We haven't been wanting to do that because we want to make sure that vaccines are actually available uh, if people have an appointment and not turn people away. The other thing that we can do is make sure that we're putting the amount of vaccine, supplying the vaccines in accordance with the populations that are eligible. Uh, as I mentioned, the state of Texas opened up eligibility to all of population 1A and 1B. Well, they didn't proportionally supply us with the amount of vaccine that we are needing because population 1A and 1B in Bear County is disproportionately high. What we need is more supply. So there are a few things that can, that can happen immediately to help address this. And of course, the biggest issue right now is we need the, to, the federal government to exert its authority and, and put the weight of the government behind ramping up manufacturing of these vaccines. This is uh, a, as an important a, a part of the pandemic as the beginning was, and we need to finish the job. We've seen so many events canceled because of the pandemic. We're a few short weeks away, though, in the midst of this surge from the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo opening up. You go on their website, they list all the precautions that so many of us are used to at this point that will be taken, but it's still a huge event that's going to be happening in our community as of now. So do you think that it is a good idea for us to move forward with this, or have you been in any talks involving that very topic? So what I will tell you is that uh, the county has taken a very uh, cautious approach um, in, in, in their discussions, and, and you've heard the judge speak every night about this about making sure that they're mindful of public health guidance. And, and you saw that take place with the cancellation of the carnival. Uh, I think that you know the best approach is to be mindful of what the circumstances are as we get closer to that event and, and you know, uh, act accordingly. I think that the, the public health pr precautions that are in place right now are, are a very good start. And I'm hopeful that you know, we can continue to enjoy more events as the time goes on, but we're gonna have to remind ourselves that we're not out of it yet. So that means take a mask, that means practice proper distancing. And if you're gonna to go to an event, recognize that it's regulated per the health protocols and be ready to comply with them. If not, stay home. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, always appreciate your time. Thanks y'all, have a good night. You as well, we'll be right back. At first, good morning to you. It's Tuesday, the 19th of January. Thanks for joining us. And we begin with COVID-19 and the vaccine. Governor Greg Abbott taking a hopeful tone today regarding future vaccine distributions. During a visit to Houston Methodist today, Governor Abbott praised large-scale vaccine hubs like that one for helping to push out the vaccine. The ongoing pandemic has also led to a major call for blood donations from people who are currently healthy, regardless of a former COVID-19 diagnosis. We're seeing about a 35% increase uh, of uh, orders from the average of, from hospitals. Driver arrested after a crash on the city's west side last night. 50-year-old Carlos Landine now facing char a charge of intoxication assault. 
Police tell us Landine speeding and driving on the wrong side of the road when he T-boned another driver, pushing that driver's car for about half a block before coming to a stop. Now know the name of the man who was shot and killed following a crash on the city's west side last night. Investigators say the two drivers pulled over and got into a fight along the access road. That's when they say 39-year-old Ryan Wan was shot twice in the chest. He later died. The suspect and a witness were both interviewed by police. Officers say charges are now pending against that suspect. An emotional Joe Biden thanking his supporters in Delaware before heading to Washington, D.C. this afternoon. It's the last time he'll leave his home in Wilmington as president-elect. Excuse the emotion, but when I die, Delaware be written on my heart. Temps continue to drop. It's now 52 degrees in San Antonio. Still 70, though, in Pleasanton. 45 in Kerrville and 45 in Rock Springs. We do still have some scattered showers generally north of Highway 90 around San Antonio. Tomorrow morning, there will be scattered hit or miss showers. 47 degrees, a high temperature only in the low to mid 50s with rain tapering off in the afternoon. We'll carry a chance, though, for isolated showers and even a few storms into the weekend. It's going to be a pretty mild forecast, too. Temperatures will get back into the 70s throughout the weekend as well. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.